Good afternoon and welcome to the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. I hope um, you're off the good start of Ramadan. It's the first event that we have during uh, Ramadan. My name is Gianluca Parolin and I will be the moderator of today's um, lecture. I'm professor of law at the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations and have had the privilege of knowing our guest speaker for today's lecture because of our common interest in citizenship and the Gulf. Uh, it was a stellar scholar uh, of Kuwait and its politics, the late Marianne Tatreo, uh, who facilitated our encounter. And I think we both feel quite indebted to her for all the scholarship and humanity that she shared with Ahaz her students and colleagues. She is still greatly missed. Before I introduce the series and our speaker, let me share some of the housekeeping rules uh, for today. It used to be fire exit and powder rooms. Now it's Zoom etiquette. Um, all participants should remain muted until they are invited to unmute themselves during the Q&A session to ask questions or make comments. The chat function will be available throughout the lecture, but I would refrain from using it until the Q&A session. Whoever wishes to have their camera on, they are free to do so or not to do so, you, up to you. The session is being recorded, so if you then choose to unmute and on turn on your camera, you will be part of the recording. If you don't, do not want to be recorded, and yet wish to ask a question or make a comment, then please use the chat function during a Q&A session. The lecture today is part of the joint lecture series, which is a joint initiative of the Aga Khan Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations and the Aga Khan Trust for Cultures Education Program. The Aga Khan Agency for Habitat and the Aga Khan Museum are also organizing partners, partners this year. And this year's theme, by the way, is sustainability. Today's lecture in particular is presented by AKU ISMC's governance program. So please visit our website to find out more about our activities. We are extremely pleased to have with us today Rania Maktabi whose work on citizenship and her fieldwork throughout the region make her an ideal speaker to address some of the questions that sustainability raises. First and foremost, I think we will appreciate how a, a political scientist like Rania frames questions of sustainability and education and culture while reflecting on her own work. Her lecture will focus on her recent fieldwork in Qatar and most of the phot photographs um, she will use to illustrate some of her points were actually taken by, ho by her, so also a gifted photographer. Rania's academic affiliation is with the Østfold University College in Norway. Her research on citizenship looks in particular at the intersections between law, religion, and politics. Even if we will mostly hear about Rania's recent fieldwork in Qatar, she had conducted extensive fieldwork in Lebanon and Kuwait, but also in Syria, Egypt, and Morocco. Some of Rania's earlier scholarship is used in our MA curriculum at AKU ISMC, but let me mention here two recent works of her that may be of interest to participants. First, Female Citizenship in Kuwait and Qatar, Globalization and Pressures for Reform in Two Rentier States, which came out in 2016 by Midaba. And the forthcoming entry, Women, Woman and Citizenship in the Routledge Handbook on Women in the Middle East. Rania's talk today is titled Global Citizenship Golf Style, with the subtitle that I'm sure she will illustrate during her lecture. We expect Rania to speak for approximately 30, 35 to 40 minutes, after which I will get the conversation started while opening the floor for questions and comments. 
So please join me in virtually welcoming Rania Maktabi. So Rania, the floor is yours. Thank you again for being Thank with you. us. Thank you so much, Anluka. And that's so kind for you to remind us of our uh, joint connection with Mary Ann Tetro. God bless her soul. I think that was really nice. Now, I have this photo, this beautiful photo, which uh, is of a mosque. And now it's Ramadan. And I thought, you know, this should be the prize uh, photo uh of uh, uh hamad bin khalifa mosque in education city so this is the big mosque inaugurated in 2014 i will talk more about this mosque later on uh, but i will start my uh, my talk with uh, talking about uh, global citizenship in general and um and i must ha uh, add you know these uh i i, I have uh, the, the, I, I, want, I will talk about three H's, uh, hands, head, and homeland. These three H's are sort of catchwords I will use uh, during my talk. When I talk about hands, I'm thinking about the workers who th come so much to the Gulf. You know, and there are millions of workers coming from all around Asia and also the world uh, to these places, uh, to these Gulf states. The heads are people like me, who also think you know these places offer something um, new, magnificent uh, in ways of uh, top-notch universities and places to think, work, and write. And uh, the homeland is sort of, you know, when we talk about global citizenship, it's like, what is that? It's a place to belong to, but then you should actually. The, the message is mostly that please go back to your homeland when you have finished visiting us. So this is sort of the three catchwords I will uh, point out later on. Um, so what is the Gulf? This is the Gulf monarchies. I will focus mostly on the tiny city-states because the largest uh, uh, monarchy is, of course, Saudi Arabia, the heartland of the Muslim world, if we can say that, because Mecca is there. But uh, you have Oman, Kuwait, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. And uh, these states uh, are have nearly always since their beginning been globalized i mean they have been under the ottoman empire but they were very much sovereign there was a large high degree of autonomy so uh, the ottoman empire was not had a, did not have a strong hand on these states so they were this is really interesting that the the the, the tribal the tribes who were big in these small states they were reveling between each other and Britain had a sort of overall view uh, under the British Empire period, but they really had a high degree of autonomy. And this is why we can, I can say, or we say that they have, they have been, uh, they have been globalized, of course, uh, for the past 100 years because they are carbon rich societies and they have become rich because of oil and gas. Um, so the smallest states here, Kuwait and Qatar, you see, very small states, and you have the big brother, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the, the largest state, uh, uh, of course. And, uh, and uh, what, uh, what, what is fascinating about these small city-states is that one could say that when the British Empire uh, had uh, made, uh, made agreements uh, with uh, the some rulers, these rulers which the British made uh, contact with became today's dynasty, uh, dynastic rulers. So the British helped these rulers to become today's uh, uh, dynastic rulers of, of these states. But you could also say it the other way around, uh, because you could say that the, these dynasties came to power because they, their tribal leaders were so savvy in negotiating and managing to negotiate with rural uh, with, with global powers as britain for instance so so you could also see that you know they have been negotiating globally with powers with great powers for a long period of time so i, I find that really fascinating with these small states uh, so the title of my talk is global citizenship gulf style nodes of sustain sustainability transnational education and cultural innovation. 
And I have divided my talk into two because the transnational education part and the cultural innovation part, I will show a lot of pictures just to symbolize. But let me start with a sort of hard concept, concept work because what is known? What is sustainability in my talk? What is global citizenship? So let's start with that. What is a node? If I wanted to pick a picture of what a node is, the library uh, springs to my mind as no better way to symbolize what a node is than, than a library. The library is a node at once material and immaterial as space because people and knowledge connect in libraries. And uh, here are two examples. One is the library which I was, you know, that's where I go and sit and read and write at Georgetown University in Doha in Qatar. The other one is a fascinating entrance. It, it looks like you walk into a spaceship of knowledge and it is made by a Dutch, um, uh, the, a Dutch uh, uh, architect. I think his, um, oops, I, I, I forgot his name right now. Dutch architect, I know, Rem Koolhaus, Rem Koolhaus. And what, what, what brings you into mind is that, you know, you enter a space and note where ideas, uh, concepts, people connect. This is where we meet. So this is the, the type of note I want to sort of explain. Global citizenship. So you go into the spaceship of a, of a national uh, uh, library in Qatar, but at the same time, and this uh, piece is a piece from the Berlin Wall. And it is stands right on the right hand of the entrance of the of the Georgetown Library, which I showed you the picture of. What does this give you when you see this? It gives you, you know, like you're standing beside a piece of history. So it gives you or me the impression that I'm standing in this place, which is a place of knowledge, a node of knowledge, and at the same time, it connects me with history. I mean, history in 1989, the downfall of the Soviet Union. And here stands a piece of the Berlin Wall outside, uh, outside uh, this library. But at the same time, and now we're talking about checkpoints. I mean, Checkpoint Charlie with the Berlin Wall. But when I talk about checkpoints in the Gulf, I mean that, you know, it, it gives you the idea that you're a part of a global citizenship uh, position, but you have to pass a lot of checkpoints to enter Qatar or the other Gulf states. At least you have to have a visa, uh, you have to have uh, um, um, the ability to travel there, uh, money to travel there and stay there. So, so it's, it's this that you can come and visit and then please go back to your homeland. You, know, you, you can share these, these uh, the, the educational uh, offer, offers that these states uh, give, but but leave, or you can come and work, make some money, but leave. So this global citizenship is both inclusive and exclusive at the same time. Now sustainability, and I chose this, and all these pictures are taken, by the way, at the Education City and outside Georgetown. And I found this really beautiful kind of hobbit kind of house, you know. Uh, you see, you can go there, and when it's very heatful, you can go there inside and sit and read and watch and then uh, get uh, it is built in a way where you get a nice temperature, even if it's like 50 degrees uh, outside. So, but sustainability for me now, if we talk about the, the UN uh, sustainability goals, the 17, which uh, includes uh, the erosion of, uh, uh, of, uh, of poverty, hunger, health, uh, education is number four, gender equality is number five, uh, and uh, we have this sustainable cities. Now, Qatar and the other Gulf states are trying to present themselves as sustainable uh, cities. Uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, they're turning, they're turning the desert green. You know, this is the eco green card of sustainability. They, they, you know, putting the the uh, planting very beautiful trees and uh, plants everywhere, but. If we look also at the other part here, we have also sustainability, which I call the human part, because, and I didn't take much pictures of people because I feel this is, this is what you see, the workers behind the green sustainability, they are taken from afar. But these are the people who come to Qatar and the other Gulf states to work and make 
the desert green. So I think this is very important to understand and to keep in the uh, back of our minds because I will be showing so many pictures of the results of the hardware of the people, the hands and the sweat of the people working in these environments, uh, which is not only green, it's, it has, it has the, the labor part, which I think is very important to, 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 to focus upon, especially because Qatar now has uh, got the FIFA World Cup uh, next year. And uh, this article in The Guardian made a huge, huge uproar in Norway uh, last month. Uh, when it came out uh, in uh, or two months ago in, in February uh, because of uh, the labor costs uh, of people dying while building all these nice buildings uh, which I will be showing pictures of uh, and uh, the argument is that should we participate in a football FIFA World Cup where in states uh, which uh, who do not uphold human rights or worker rights so I think it is important to put that in focus. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, remembering that uh, these states are maneuvering uh, their positions with, uh, with uh, not only sports, because there is a huge, lots of other ways which they are projecting, projecting themselves as, as global city states. Uh, so, and these states are, very much privileged uh, uh, states have privileged citizens and when i wanted to choose a picture of a privileged citizen i thought okay this is a wedding usually you know in, in western media when you put a wedding the first picture you put is of course the, the, the picture of the bride and her her very beautiful white comb but in qatari newspapers and i find that this is really interesting it's only pictures of men now i'm not i'm not criticizing that you don't see the brides but i think it's a good picture to show how how, how males are privileged you know the males and i don't know who abdullah abdurrahman Fakhru is but but this is what you get every friday or so in the newspapers and the point i was i want to make with this picture is to show that you know these are privileged citizens in states where citizens comprise 10 percent of the population 10 percent in qatar in the, uh, and also 15%, for example, in the United Arab Emirates, where you have Dubai and, uh, and Abu Dhabi as two small states. In Saudi Arabia, you have 40% uh, citizens, 60% non-citizens. In Kuwait, it's like 30% citizens, 70% non-citizens. So you have this uh, mismatch between the number of citizens and non-citizens, and citizens are privileged. We can say that citizens in the Gulf states are members of VIP clubs. Uh, this is Michael Walter, who is a political philosopher, who says, you know, they are members of a club, uh, and the states are actually clubs, and they welcome everybody. Everybody can be members, but they are the VIP members with, which are privileged. And I would argue that, okay, yes, and female, citizens are less privileged VIP members. So that is sort of VIP members minus. And why do I say that? This is because if I want to choose one argument to say that uh, female citizens are less privileged, is that when women want to marry a man who is a non-citizen, then her children become non-citizens. So uh, in these states, the female citizenship is very uh, male dominated in the sense that the male kin is the, the, the kin that counts. And I, I believe Gianluca has lots more to say about the male kin citizenship kind, but okay. So to sum up, you know, these carbon rich polities are, have been rich since the 1930s and they are, have this complex webs and layers of nodes of sustainability for nature and people, citizens and migrants uh, in harsh climate conditions. And I really want to see, you know, you scratch the surface and you get sand. And you have these beautiful green places which really needs lots and lots of water in places which are so, so dry. So you have zigzags of water. You don't see them here, but I took other pictures. But you see, it, they really need lots of, lots of water. So the question about sustainability is that, okay, they look green, but they need a lot of energy to keep green. So this is, this is the complex web of, of layers which I want to argue about uh, or focus about. So remember... So, so these are city-states in the globalized world, and and uh, and uh, you know they are building 
uh, skyscrapers, uh, one higher than the other. And, uh, and how did they make that? Now, this is back to what I uh, said earlier on, that they are states which have been uh, negotiating with global powers since the 1930s. So they, they also know how to rebuild, remold, state build their states in ways which are globalized. And they have always done it uh, since the 1940s. Well, how do you do it? You treat great powers very well. You are very nice to the US, for example. Uh, you said military power, I mean. I mean, first it was the British uh, and then the, the Americans after the 1940s. Uh, you buy weapons from the states, you stay on terms with them, uh, and you negotiate and choose timings when you are friends with them and when you want to show that you are not so much friends with them. Like, I want to give a very important example here to show how Qatar has become such a powerful small city-state. And uh, the reason is uh, for that is that uh, uh, Saudi Arabia was the place where uh, American troops were positioned until 9-11 in 2001, and we are talking 20 years ago now. Uh, when 9-11 occurred, a terror attacks against the US. Saudi Arabia uh, removed all US military forces out of Saudi Arabia. Now, one of the main arguments uh, against the Saudi regime by extreme Islamists like Osama bin Laden and most of these who made the terror attacks in 9-11. And remember, 17 of the people, uh, 15 were Saudi Arabian, two were Emiratis. So the 17, you know, they say were, they were Muslims, but they were Gulf citizens. You know, 15 were Saudi Arabian citizens and two were Emirati citizens. So the point is that this 9-11 attack uh, prompted uh, the Saudi regime to get rid of their troops, the American troops, and the troops went to the small city-state of Qatar. So today, al base in uh, Qatar is the largest place where you have more than 11,000 U.S. personnel. No place else in the Middle East has more uh, U.S. personnel than in Qatar. And uh, another thing you do, is that you built a very nice TV station, media station, media network, which of course we know as Al Jazeera Media Network. Now the fascinating, uh, this when I talk about the uh, globalized city-state, is that when Hamad bin Khalifa, who is the father of today's Tamim, who, who, uh, gained, uh, who came to power, who is the, the current leader in Qatar, he made, Hamad, made a, a bloodless coup in 1995. And he did uh, many things, but among the first thing he did was to uh, shut down the information ministry and build Al Jazeera network. It was in 1995. In 1996, Al Jazeera was an uh, uh, Arab, uh, Arabic-speaking global network, uh, which the world had never seen uh, uh, before. So, uh, and 10 years later, in 2006, the English uh, Al Jazeera network was established. And I remember very well, I did fieldwork in Syria in uh, November 2006, and I was like living in this place in Damascus, which looked like, you know, post-communist state. That was before the war, of course, but, and I said, what is this? They're opening <laughs> an international broadcast in Qatar. What am I doing here in, in, in Damascus? Because you know, the reading the newspapers in Damascus in 2006 was like reading the newspapers in the 1970s. It was really very strange to see that they were opening this hyper-modern digitalized media in, in Doha. And I'm sitting in Damascus reading newspapers that look like 40-year-old news. That was really fascinating. So uh, one point about global citizenship. And these states are very fi financialized. You know, capital. Uh, plays a huge role because uh, you can't use oil, you can't use gas. You have to, for these states, they have to transform oil and gas into capital in order to to uh, to to uh, uh, de develop. And this is what they do. Now, this is I don't know if I'm going to call it luxury. It's a picture of luxury, at least. It's a, it's, it's an image of luxury. Uh, and the point I want to make with this picture is, this is taken in Qatar uh, in Doha, is that uh, these states make investments. 
uh, they don't, don't only sell oil and gas, but they use the money they, they get by, after selling the oil and gas, and of course, buy themselves in all over the world, in corporations, in, in, uh, in, um, in uh, real estate, uh, and uh, especially for Qatar, which is not oil, because Qatar is the largest gas producing uh, uh, nation uh, uh, exporter. It owns 13% of all proven gas reserves in the world. And this is really interesting. What happened in, uh, in, um, in Qatar is that in 1995, and now we are over in te sustainable technology, uh, before 1995, gas could, could not be transferred, uh, transported very easily. So there was this innovation of making gas liquid. So we called it liquefied gas. And what happened in Qatar, they immediately went into this, uh, this uh, technology and they made friends with Japan. Japan uh, was the, is the lar one of the largest uh, uh, liquefied importing nations of the world. So this bonding between Japan and Qatar goes way back to 1995, exactly at the same time as Al Jazeera was made, exactly at the same time as uh, Qatar opened its doors uh, to US troops, but they didn't come in 1995, uh, they came after 2001. So six years uh, it took uh, from uh, the day where uh, Qatar said to the US, come to and put your bases at our place. So uh, media, a military and uh, finance capital and this prompted uh, this uh, book by the french economist um, uh, economist thomas piketty who said in the norwegian edition I, I cut it out it is currently too early to say to our readers whether we will be paying our house rent in 2050 to the emir of qatar of course this is because he was commenting on how these states are transforming their uh, capital into investments and they can live happily happily ever after, only by uh, the investments. And this is what is happening with the, if we want to understand what these states are doing now, they are financializing their capital in ways where they can survive and uh, develop only on finances and not only be dependent on oil and gas. Uh, uh, so I call the, so Qatar Investment Authority is, what we call the the, the big uh, uh, the, the 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 bank <laughs> system of of uh, Qatar, or maybe also the purse of the current uh, regime in in Qatar. Uh, in two thousand and seventeen, it was estimated that uh, they get three hundred and thirty five billion dollars uh, worth uh, in capital. Uh, so they invest all over the world. But the, the one which, uh, which uh, invests most in culture, which is sort of what we will be, I would show more pictures about, is Qatar Foundation, which is what I call the river. And this is a song by the water boys, by the way, you know. They said, this is the sea and, and this is the river. So the sea is the Qatar uh, investment authority and the, the small river, which is what we are interested in here, is Qatar Foundation. Where, and they are culturalizing capital, you know, like, or I called it capital culturalized. And you have this huge uh, think tank here, which is the headquarters of, of Qatar Foundations. This is how it looks from outside. I couldn't get inside, but I, I took this picture from their home side. So, 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 and it is situated in, in uh, this city here called Education City. Education City is a huge piece in Doha. Uh, which is outside the city center, but where ha they have built really nice universities, um, nine international universities, most of them American, but you have also British and French, and 11 schools. So it's all both over 18 and less than 18. And what they offer there is, and this is important, I think, they are attracting youth from the global south and also the world's multicultural aspiring middle class. And I quote from their uh, website, is that you have funding opportunities interest-free. We offer range, a range of scholarships and need-based financial aid options for students. Our admissions are need-blind and we remain committed to attracting the best students from around the world, regardless of their financial needs. Our loans are interest-free and include an option for repayment through working at one of hundreds of approved organizations in Qatar.
Had I been somebody who without parents who can pay for my uh, education, I would immediately apply there. I mean, this is what they they are in, inviting the students of the world. Okay, you have your heads. Come to us. We will give you the opportunity to flourish. And this is this is the places where they offer. You know, it's really beautiful places, architectural uh, innovations. Uh, this is the Cornell Medicine Qatar. This is uh, Georgetown University where I stayed uh, most of my time at the Center for International and Regional Studies. And yes, imagine, writ large, on student dorms. Yes, you can. This is what the building is saying to the students when they go there. I thought that is fascinating. You know, besides that, it's a beautiful song by John Lennon and Yoko Ono. She wrote the song, uh, the, the, some, some of the lyrics. And, anyway, so, you know, imagine. And it's written everywhere. You can see this imagine in different. I just showed this picture. But it's sort of, you can do it. And behind all this glory is, of course, the QF. The QF is this mark. This is outside Georgetown University's main, uh, uh, one of the entrances at Georgetown University. But you can see here the QF is what I call the River Qatar Foundation, which is, uh, which is of course, uh, sponsoring all these buildings and uh, telling the students to come interest-free to study there. Now over to the cultural innovation. What you see here beside you is, because it is Ramadan, this is a mosque. Beautiful mosque, perhaps one of the most beautiful I've seen. I call this mosque uh, her whale ship, and I think you can guess why. <laughs> the first time I saw it, I really, without, without, I mean, uh, very suddenly I started to, uh, tears were run down my eyes because I, I couldn't believe that they could do something like that because it's so gracious. It's huge, but it's very gracious and very, sort of modest in, in, its, in its hugeness. And so when I want to say this cultural innovation in the Muslim world, I could find of no better picture and of, of this mosque. So what do you think about it? You know, uh, it was inaugurated in 2004. And, uh, and when I saw it, I must say, now I'm in this, uh, <laughs> I'm not the political scientist now, I'm the poet who wrote these words when I saw it, uh, a spaceship from heaven galactical glory in the form of a whale, colossal and yet so humble, an architectural wonder, as small and grand as Cairo's Ibn Tulum, as mighty and elegantly gracious in your splendor, or fabulous mosque of Al Madina at Talimiyya, which is education city. Here is more from that poem, teasing teeth with grand windows in the shape of a piano, or piano tangits, an accordion of one long jaw smiling generously at you, sending coded signals through heated air. Come in, I won't swallow you. Minarets in the form of two tentacles, two exclamation marks flying like willows, floating like a butterfly. Splashing water under your body of shady paint, her whale ship blessing kids while their joy echoes transforming children's voices into a choir of delight. And here are the hands. Behind all the wonders, hands busy mending and removing weeds. So this is another ar architectural wonder, and it is the Qatar National Museum. Uh, it is called the Desert Rose. And why is it called Desert Rose? Uh, it is uh, designed by a French architect, but uh, he chose uh, a very interesting small... This is a desert rose, and this is for real. Um, it is a sand figure, which becomes uh, hard as stone, and it is scattered throughout the desert in Qatar in the shape of roses forged by wind and humidity. And you can buy it uh, in, the, in the museum, and the museum look, looks like that. You know, you go enter the museum, and you start looking at this museum as if it is, oh, the shop, the souvenir shop is a museum by itself. At the same time, you enter one of the rooms in this Qatar museum, and uh, they mix tradition with artistic expression, because I can hear the voice of this woman uh, at the National Museum, and she is telling me 
uh, that uh, we kept our sheep and worked inside the tents. You know, it, it, it is really fascinating to go inside, you know, ultra modern buildings and, and hear these stories by oral histories. And I thought that was really fascinating to hear because I understand Arabic. I also felt very, very near to this history and the modernity. And then you go out and you see this splendid artistic, you know, mosque. A little bit Darth Vader, but really nice. <laughs> and and this is a picture I, I took from the internet by Alex Sergeyev, but but I could see this from my window from uh, the the my 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 uh, the, my office at uh, at uh, Georgetown University. And I didn't know that, but I looked at these these sculpture. It is a hospital, and uh, they are made by Damien Hurst. And I, I had to look them. I said, is it really true? I had to look it up. And it's a, it's a world-renowned scholar, uh, a sculpture, who made them. And uh, it, evidently, I heard from others that they made an uproar uh, when they were placed out in 2014 or whatever. But after four years, uh, the, uh, the, the the leaders, um, spiritual leaders, Muslim leaders women and also uh, others said that this is a celebration of life and uh, Muslim uh, faith does not uh, for forbid uh, the, the celebration of life. And so we have the stages of birth until the, you know, from small, small sp uh, sperm until birth, uh, which is outside the Sidra hospital, which is the big hospital in uh, Qatar. And uh, so some small reflections in conclusion. Uh, okay, uh, what are the, this is the first, and I will conclude here. What are the similarities and differences we find between ancient and contemporary forms of belonging when we are talking about citizenship? This is sort of a broad question I pose. To sum up, so we can say that since the turn of the millennium, the oil-rich Gulf city-states have emerged as global nodes of finance, migration, architecture, education, and culture in a hyper mediatized world. These states shape forms of global citizenship in ways where the concept of sustainability is expressed in ways that attract millions of working hands as well as thousands of heads who seek knowledge. My focus has been on how education and architecture represent fundamental venues for molding new forms of global Muslim identities, religious and secular which are exclusive and inclusive in intricate ways. And uh, perhaps this is the last, uh, the last uh, picture I wanted to show. And homage to Italian uh, sculpture, uh, who is, um, uh, oops, what is his name? I have his name here. Um, hmm. Lorenzo Quinn. Now the first, and I, this is the, the, my final point, is that, oh yeah, it is written here, I'm sorry. Uh, and the, the, the interesting thing is that this, this sculpture was bought by, uh, by uh, British. It is in Berkeley Square, somewhere in London. And uh, it was, uh, bought, it was, it was uh, bought in February 2011. Like eight months later, you could find the statue in uh, Qatar. Uh, next, the, the year after, uh, Mother Nature number three, you could find it in the US uh, and New York. And Mo Mother Nature 4 is found in China. But, uh, so, so to close up here, the city-state is sort of participating in a competition of art <laughs> and glory with you know, the old superpower, Great Britain, and the two new, or one is waning, the US, and the new one, China. So I thought that was really fascinating. These are the four statues in the world, and, Doha, and you'll find one of them in Doha. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. That was marvelous. Um, as um, oh, I invite I can't participants, hear you, uh, Gianluca. pardon? No, oh, okay. I hear you now. Yeah, uh, I was thanking you, and I was uh, inviting participants if they want to um, raise their hands uh, or uh, write their questions or comments on the chat uh, in the chat function. Uh, they're more uh, than uh, welcome to do so. Uh, I will just start the 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 conversation um with a few reflections on what uh, rania shared with us and actually uh prompting um rania to um maybe um also 
uh, consider, I think that there's one theme that sort of was recurring and that you also closed on that note, which was competition. And mm -hmm. uh, competition somehow surfaced when you were describing the creation of the modern states uh, with the competition among um, different uh, aspiring ruling um, um, dynasties. Um, in a way, uh, it did not surface, but it sort of uh, struck me when you show the picture of the wedding in Qatar, because that was from a Qatari um, newspaper. But it's, it's, of course, of the Fakhru family, which is very much uh, spread across uh, Bahrain and Qatar. And, uh, you know, we have so many scholars in the social sciences from the Fakhru family okay. in uh, Bahrain. And so in that sense, um, it's it, the competition between these various small um, city-states, as you call them, um, lives in a context in which there's a lot of transnational um, dynamics within them. That is, uh, the Fahro example is not a, a unique example. I would say it's actually generally the rule, that is that uh, kin groups are spread across uh, modern states that did not exist as such before um, independence. And actually, the original plan was to actually have a general federation. So in a sense, uh, it's funny because this, uh, uh, you know, as you were correctly describing the idea of these privileged citizens, um, looking in the face of non-privileged citizens, uh, I think that what we're seeing here is also oh. another layer, which is privileged citizens of other Gulf countries that have a very different status from the others. And so those sort of um, trans transnational dynamics uh, operate in the competition, in the framework of competition. So I find that extremely, um, you know, uh, complex in a way and fascinating in another way. And then, you know, sort of like you, this competition comes back uh, when you look, when you, uh, when you point it as to the, uh, you know, to the first steps in uh, pan-Arab media, you know, and so you, you talked about Al Jazeera, but then, you know, the immediate response, not immediate, immediate, but the, you know, the very prompt response was Al Arabiya in the Emirates. So this competition operates in many levels. So for the, for the sector that you described here, which is um, education, I was wondering if you um, wanted to share something from your previous experience in Kuwait, where in a way the investment on education um, was of a very different type in a way, in that sense, but I would like to hear your um, uh, thoughts about it. I don't want to, to jump to conclusions, but my sense as an observer is that it's, it's very different from what you described about Qatar, but in a way very similar to other contexts like, for instance, like Egypt or Lebanon in the sense of having um, a mix of national and foreign providers um, in education, in higher education. But a sort of like a longer um, history of that when compared to Qatar and suddenly Qatar comes to the to the to the game and here we have this huge education city that you showed us which is you know like exceptional every as you described every single university has a campus which is an architectural uh, marvel um, but then again competition comes up so the Emirates you know want to attract their own um, foreign universities. And then within the Emirates, Abu Dhabi wants to, yeah. you know, to position itself as the cultural capital of, not just the political, but also the cultural capital of the Emirates. And so they struck these deals with Sorbonne, with uh, NYU, uh, and they create these campuses. Um, and, and that generates, so it's, it's clearly out of competition, but then in a sense, they generate um, a series of very significant investments, mm. which are, I think, at the, at the heart of the reason why we decided to discuss 
um, yeah. education city with you in terms of sustainability because in a way they're quintessentially non-sustainable as um, i'm not sure about that actually okay so i would yeah so i would like you to to, to because I, I i i totally agree with you is there a place for all these huge places to attract education uh you know minds or what i have called heads from around the world i i totally agree with you but uh, perhaps the, uh, these rulers will be laugh having the last laugh and uh, we are talking about uh, economic inequalities around the world which is prompting youth from uh, what we know as previous middle class low middle class around the world maybe this is the future for the future uh, generations which who will not be able to study uh, for the same amount of money which their parents could. So I'm not sure that they are not sustainable in the future in a globalized citizenship world where nomadic academics, young people will travel to these places. Perhaps they are empty now, perhaps they are not empty in tomorrow. And talking about yesterday and tomorrow, I want to put this phrase from, because the thing is that in 2012, I was really doing research in, or I was doing research, as I said to you in Syria, because that was really fascinating place to be in 2006 and 2007 and eight and so on. And then suddenly the Arab Spring comes, you know, and we academics, we got shock. <laughs> what shall we do? So I remember very well, I went, you know, okay, I went to Kuwait because I thought I could not do research in Syria anymore. Then, you know, there's a civil war going on and it will rage forever. And it still does. I mean, 10 years later. So I went to Kuwait and Qatar precisely because this is where the money comes. And I want to sh share with you a picture uh, later on. I will show it. I will just finish uh, my argument. And uh, this is because one of the major conclusions of a decade of Arab revolts is that the Arab world is Gulfized. I mean, the Gulfization of the Arab world is something which uh, we are experiencing today. Money is bringing people from all over the Arab world to the Gulf, and they are putting their mark. So I'm not sure that these places will remain empty. And one thing, I met a student at Qatar University in 2012, and she told me, you know, Kuwait was yesterday, Dubai is today, and Doha is tomorrow. I mean, they were really proud of what Doha is doing now. And she says, okay, this, the future is ours. And at the time i was like what is this this is you know this is a very small place but 10 years later i think maybe she has something this young student she was like 21 22 she's you know she's 10 years older now and i'm 10 years wiser and i'm i'm really thinking maybe maybe these guys are understanding something i don't because 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 uh they may be attracting and because they have the money to to what you call to tease people to come there and then go back home which is you know go back to your homeland we don't want you for too long because we cannot take the expenditure for your health services and small things like that you know and pensions and so on so so this sustainability i think is a, a point i do not totally agree with you because i think maybe they are doing something uh, like uh, investments and and the competition yes you are right there's a lot of competition between these states but uh, maybe it's like market competition it's it sort of uh, tickles and uh, prompts them to invest more and I mean, we as academics, why not? Can they invest in, 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 in education? Let them do it. Maybe we can fill the space. Uh, and, and, but you know, the, 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 perhaps the more intriguing argument is that how free are these universities? You know, how free will academia be? Because we know that in the uh, UAE, uh, they cannot write whatever they want and they don't do that. So there is a huge self-censorship among Arabs and among other academics. And I, this is, I think this, this is a more grave argument uh, that they are, offering, uh, they are offering education and they will define how academic education will be in 50 years time. I am very afraid of that, that the knowledge is not free, that you will not have uh, freedom of consciousness because you are tied to having your bread and butter in these states this is for me a much bigger problem um, th so as 
I solicit again those who want to ask questions or make comments to feel free to do so. Uh, again, either by raising their hands or uh, writing in the chat box. Uh, let me thank you for bringing in the long durée question on the sustainability, because I think that that's exactly what um, we were looking at by looking at the systems, like the huge investments that are being made um, are certainly, you know, in the short period, non-sustainable. But as you correctly pointed out, it's like if you take a long durée, uh, approach to the thing, the entire investment takes up a new um, new light and new colors, which I think is very important to remember when we think of the function of uh, higher education and what sort of investment it requires and what it contributes to sustainability in the long term rather than in the short term. And so it's certainly not a question of revenue making, of profit making, but rather a sort of like um, a, a contribution and positioning and building a signature that is considered to be, you know, worth the investment. And I think that that's, that's a very interesting um, uh, perspective there. Um, I don't see any questions, so I will um, um, take the opportunity. Oh, I, there is a question from our co-host, Raj, please. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself or ask the question uh, as you want. Unmute. Am I am I now unmuted? We can hear you now. Yes. Now I'm now I'm unmuted. Thank you, thank you, Gianluca, and and uh, thank you very much, Rania. That was so wide ranging and and so interesting and provocative, um, and I'm very glad to to, to be able to followed this session. Uh, I, I followed as many as I could, obviously, since uh, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture has the privilege of being a co-host. But I'm not here to say that and make all of these formal statements. What I'm really here, uh, why I asked for the floor, uh, Rania, is just to ask you if you could share with us a bit of your impression of the sense that the um, leadership, the the, the the, the top of the society in these, these Gulf monarchies, how do they see the long-term cultural sustainability of their own societies? That is, how are they conceiving of this culture that in, in a generation has gone from the tent to the, the skyscraper? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, they are seeing that. I think uh, one of the most visible, important decision made by Qatar, for example, uh, which tackles precisely what you say, Raj, there, is that uh, they chose that one university, Qatar University, has to have Arabic as main language. And they decided that in 2012 or 11, I think, or what. So this cultural heritage based on language so that English does not become a lingua franca in Qatar was taken seriously by this decision. And I, this is a one very small decision of, uh, of choosing to have Arabic as main language of teaching in one university, totally in Arabic. The, the other thing which me personally, I find very interesting is that these states uh, have lots of people working uh, in homes, which I find interesting, that they are very afraid of losing their cultural uh, heritage and the uh, Arab customs and so on. But the families in Qatar and all the other states have so many uh, persons working for them from Asia, from Africa, uh, as ho home uh, workers, you know, domestic workers, uh, uh, pay, uh, paying attention for the children. And you know, I'm a mother of three, and I saw so many Asian women taking care of the children. And, I, and this is in front of my eyes, and see it in uh, Kuwait, and I see it in Qatar. I always see it. They are taking care of the children. And I find it fascinating. They want to keep their culture and their heritage and the, um, uh, the, the norms and everything that has to do, but they give the most important parts of the renovation of culture and history and family and whatever to, 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 to other people, which I find interesting. You know, how could you give the most precious 
young minds, your children, your own children, to pe other people to help you the whole day. I mean, they were playing with them while, while the, 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 the parents were eating. I, I find that interesting. They, they, they want to keep the culture, but they're giving away the precious, uh, the most precious to the children because, you know, children are very uh, pain taking. They are, they're, there's a lot of work to do to raise children. And if you don't use your own as a mother or father or, you know, your, you yourself, you use your work, your hard work to raise your own children, then you have a problem, I think, in the society. So back to sustainability. I think I'm, I want to show you pictures because I think, uh, oh, sorry, Ooh, I did something I should not do. Uh, oh, oh, can you see what I have there? No. Oh, we can see your browser now. Oh, you can see stop sharing. What did I do now? I, okay. Oh, I wanted to show something else, but maybe I'm, I'm, if I do like that, sorry, I just, um, I'm just uh, trying this one. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. So my, you know, we have some parallels with these states, and this is your neighbor states, uh, Jamuka, you know, in Greece, because well, talking about uh, uh, about competition and sustainability, you know, perhaps uh, the competition has always been there between the Greek city states, between Sparta and Athens, mostly. Uh, but but they were very much multi-layered societies, and this is what we find in the Gulf states. You know, eighty percent slaves. If we can use you know the migrant workers and the hands, which I call them the, the hands, as states, they are sustainable for some time, but perhaps not in the long run. So maybe I'm I'm arguing against my first argument is that they are sustainable to a certain level but uh, they will not be sustainable if they don't take care of their own children um, i don't know but in the ancient city states uh, you know you have the metics and this is i, I wanted to show you this because uh, the metics were people who belonged to these states but they were not citizens uh, and uh, and uh, they could participate in everything, but not political participation. And this is the same in the Gulf. You can stay there, you can become rich, you can live there for generations, but you will never be able to be part of these states. So in the long run, I don't think it is sustainable. I think they will lose so much of their uh, of their identity in a way. Uh, who knows? But but we have something of similarities between these old city states and 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 uh, the gulf states today and you know i, I just show you this picture it looks like you know this is the uh, kuwaiti parliament they walk around with these white robes you know you remind me again of these athenian kind of of uh, draperies uh Perhaps, and now I'm over to my field, which is the gender studies, and perhaps they will survive because the women participate. Because uh, in Qatar, uh, in Qatar uh, or in Kuwait, uh, women could not vote in these parliaments until 2005. Uh, in Athens, women were not able to participate uh, in political, uh, part, um, political representation, but in, in Kuwait, it was open. So again, they are changing. So um, although they are very exclusive citizenship with very, I mean, strict understandings of democracy, but again, there is a very lively parliament in Kuwait, and uh, and uh, uh, Bahrain is moving towards. Although it will uh, the volatile uh, events in uh, 2011 were a setback. Uh, but at the same time, there are parliaments where women participate. So maybe this is one way where we can say they are sustainable politically in the long run. The answer is I'm not sure how sustainable it is, but yeah, we we have to see. <laughs> I was wondering if another way to um, respond to Raj's question could be to share with us some of the very interesting field work that you have done on legal education, um, because that I think offers a, an interesting lens to sort of address mm. that same question. Mm. Um, 
Ah, this is a good point here because let me think about uh, women and studying law. Like in Qatar, I interviewed the dean at the Faculty of Law. And he said something very interesting. Uh, he said that uh, most Qatari women, uh, or, or sorry, most of our students at the Faculty of Law at Qatar University are women. And I say, uh, wh why is law so, so um, popular? He said, but the women, the, the young women here, they read. It, it's, it's a difficult uh, subject. They read. The young lads come here and, well, they don't make it, so they go to Egypt. They bring back masters or they become lawyers in less prestigious universities, but the women cannot travel out. So the young Qatari women and also the Kuwaiti women, they study very hard to enter these high, uh, uh, I mean, highly um, competitive uh, studies. And uh, they are being uh, lawyers uh, in these states uh, at a degree which is uh, higher than men. So the law studies are being feminized in Qatar and in Kuwait, these are the states I know most which I find really fascinating that, uh, that uh, the, the point that they are not able to go out and study because, you know, like respectability among families, that they don't want the young uh, women to travel abroad. So, so, so they are producing uh, uh, educated women in the field of law, which is, well, I mean, it, it takes guts to go through this uh, hard education uh, throughout four years or six years if you study for a master's or whatever. So, so I find that really fascinating. And to the point where you said uh, on the education in, for example, the, 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 between Qatar and Kuwait, Kuwait had to send their women outside to get uh, education. And this is true. In Qatar, uh, uh, they are building such huge universities. The women don't have to go out. They want them to keep them there also part of maintaining their cultural heritage, keeping the women, uh, giving them all the opportunities to study uh, their huge posters, you know, be a pilot, be an astronaut, uh, be uh, uh, pictures with women, you know, become a water engineer, uh, whatever. So they want to keep them there and quite it is different. I think it has to do with the mentality, the women I interviewed there, they could travel more abroad. They have a strong women's association. I'm not sure, but there is this, perhaps in Kuwait had this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, mentality of, uh, of uh, uh, sell and buy, you know, the, uh, you don't have that in Qatar. Yeah. Reflecting on the legal professions, um, I think it's, it's fascinating if we, if we look back that is not the situation that you're describing now for what is happening now, but rather like a few decades back. And then we see that judges, um, law professors, the legal professions in general, were imported just as mm. um, manual workers are imported now. So it's fascinating to see how on that front, there has been a clear decision to sort of shift from importing guest workers with all the benefits that guest workers bring with them for the system, not for the guest workers, of course. Um, and then substitute that with, again, investing in um, law schools um, in the various um, capitals and then uh, allowing, um, you know, wider and wider cohorts to get into those um, law schools and then you know graduate and then therefore seeking employment with those degrees so i think it's quite fascinating if you think about you know the professions themselves how they have so significantly changed and again as you mentioned it's a very sort of like well respected um degree um in, in, in the air in the region. Um, so it's, it's such a, you know, a surprising uh, change over a relatively, you know, short span of time. So yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. This point you make is really interesting because they are uh, nationalizing the judiciary in ways where judges are becoming more and more national. I mean, national citizens. Uh, and uh, we find that 
um, uh, very much uh, when it goes to women appointed in the judiciary. I mean, there was no women judge in any of these states until 2006, and now we have them in five of six states. So in a relatively short period of time, the judiciary was opened for women in ways which is you know, unprecedented. And perhaps the best example uh, is Kuwait, which opened up for law studies already in the 1967. Uh, you had a faculty of law in, uh, in Kuwait. But, uh, and uh, women in Kuwait have been studying law for you know, more than 50 years. But Kuwait has had trouble with appointing women judges. And everybody was asking, why Bahrain first? Why the Emirates? Why even in Saudi Arabia, there was a judge uh, in a tribunal for commerce, commercial tribunal, or whatever. Why not Kuwait? And then comes the pandemic, and eight women judges were appointed in August last year. So, so there is something happening very clearly into this uh, nationalization of the judiciary, of the judge uh, profession, and also women coming in. This is interesting. And my hypothesis is that these city-states or the monarchies, also Saudi Arabia, is investing in their women. They are really putting more energy on, on, uh, on uh, strengthening what I call female citizenship. And uh, you know, one of the most elite positions in the state is judge, uh, judges, and they are investing in putting women in visually prominent places uh, where uh, they can make decisions. And when we say decisions, you know, when we're talking about Islamic family law, you know, when women are in many Sharia uh, principles, uh, they are under the autonomy of men. I mean, under the guardianship of men. So when you put women in positions of decision making, this is a really powerful uh, signal that these regimes are sending because uh, because of this very uh, uh, strong understanding, not only among the regimes, but also among the people and even among the women lawyers. Because when I interviewed women lawyers in Kuwait before the women judges were appointed, I was amazed that half of the respondents thought that it was not good that women became judges. I mean, this is really interesting. So they are progressive, these regimes, in ways where they want to re, and this is one of our talk about, you know, the culture innovation thing, and which, you know, meets sustainability. The regimes are now, and I think this has to do with the Arab uprisings a decade after, they are investing in more nationalistic, uh, uh, progressive ways of, innovating religious scripts in ways where you define that women autonomy is, is important for the state. This is great for female citizenship. You know, it gives women uh, the position, the, the, the visuality of being decision makers in a fascinating way, I, I feel, I think. Uh, thank you, Rania. Um, so as, as you can tell, I'm enjoying the conversation so much that I keep asking questions. But again, I would stop at any moment that uh, uh, anyone wishes to uh, ask theirs or um, um, make a comment. Uh, let me take you back to uh, the response that you gave to Raj. These, you, um, you, you drew a parallel with the, the um, uh, Greek city-states. So, um, in a way, uh, I was wondering if, um, and you, of course, pointed to the layering of um, citizenship, even in the Greek city-states. Um, it's funny that the metikos, the, the, you know, the, the metic, the, the, you know, the, 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 the non-citizen that you identified, is someone who has changed meta ikos. Uh, changed hope. Oh, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, it has to do with the metamorphosis. I mean, the met. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. To, to change home. Okay. So I find it oh, so interesting. So anyway, really... yeah. So, in a way, my question to you would be so, is this layering of citizenship, if we draw parallels between historical cases and contemporary dimensions, do we have to, the, do we have to then conclude that there's no other way of you know, uh, of um, 
thinking of citizenship rather than a layered world or is it is there like a, like a, an alternative way of thinking about it mm. uh, yeah this is a difficult question but um uh, maybe if i think uh, along economic or economic uh, arguments as long as you have classes you will have a classified stratified citizenship so i think we have to be uh, to go to you know the more sort of martial marshallian kind of understanding because citizenship became more universal with the welfare state mm. so it has very much to do with economy and uh, and uh, dispersion of wealth in a, in a state and as long as we have territorial states uh, which uh, where you do not have the distribution of wealth globally i know piketty you know the french economist he said that we should have that in order to you know he even came to norway and said you should give away your your all wealth to bangladesh <laughs> mm. <laughs> he didn't get first pages anyway so the, the 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 point is as long as you have stratified economic societies I think we will not get rid of a stratified citizenship system. I think the two are very, very much linked. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we have such a hugely, immensely stratified, unequal societies today, and this is the fascinating thing, we have a globalized world and the inequalities have not been bigger for the past 30 years. And uh, perhaps this is why these city states are, um, you know, surfing on this unequal, unequal, uh, economic financial world in ways which becomes you know fascinating architecture uh, bringing about um, uh, and the wanting to have these the, the heads and the hands of the world mm -hmm. so 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 the answer is mm, I don't think we will get rid of stratified citizenship alas although I would really much like much less inequality I think we have to work on that I think this is the most important because stratification i think we will have as long as as uh, as uh, wealth is so disproportionately um, distributed uh, raj is raising his hand okay yeah, yeah i will give the floor to raj in a second i was just wondering because in a way you mentioned the ts marshall mm -hmm. and in a way the gulf is such a great testing ground mm -hmm. for marshall be precisely because it proves marshall Wrong, wrong in the sense that there is no this idea of generation of rights that are incremental and are based on one another what the gulf has shown us is that those are not necessarily incremental steps but they yes. can come without the other ones and of course in the case of the gulf is economic and social rights against mm -hmm. political rights so in a way it's sort of like it it entrenches even more the mm. um the inequalities that um um you were describing so mm. in a way the the gulf can you know <laughs> can be a good um area where to see how things develop in a sense yes absolutely and this is why i have always found these gulf states as fascinating uh uh you know places where uh, you know chemists have to go to the laboratory we can go to the gulf and study our stuff and and this is this is what's fascinating with these states because you know like but to point out to the marshall thing with the marx thing you know he said that uh, uh revolutions will come in the most industrialized states and it didn't come so it's like that with marshall but the sense of what they write or the essence of what both karl marx and th marshall uh, wrote is still valid mm. because although they don't come in these phases and so on but arguments are still there you know the dispersion of wealth the stratification of wealth inequalities the difference between heads and hands you know capital and work i think we we still find them in these states and this is what's fascinating in these states thank you Rania. raj would you like to um interview? thank you we we are uh monopolizing the conversation a bit, but I really don't see other people asking for the floor, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, this is another very, very, very uh, rich, potentially rich direction to take, which is the implications in the Gulf of uh, uh, migratory flows, movements of people, 
in, in relation to the questions of political philosophy that you, you've just mentioned, uh, particularly T.H. Marshall. But I had, and, and so I'm not going to go down the same road because I wanted to come back to the earlier road, which was more on, on, on the cultural. And in the sense of, if you compare the situation of the Gulf um, monarchies today to, let's say, the late 19th century, where uh, European nation states, uh, including Greece, for example, uh, were trying to define um, a national identity and inventing traditions in the Hobsbawm sense, that is, in, in, in inventing a, a narration of the nation, a narrative of the nation uh, that would then become their sense of their cultural history. Uh, what is the impact of, of all this high tech and, and joining the world, what's the impact of that on the, the idea of, that the, that the uh, people, the indigenous people of the uh, Gulf monarchies have of themselves and of their history? Mm. Oh, I think this is a wonderful question. And one of the best books I've, writ I've read are, are, is actually written by uh, Miriam Cook. You know, branding, uh, what was her book? Uh, branding politics or something uh, modern, tribal modern. Oh, it's a wonderful book. It's really wonderful. It answers your questions. Miriam Cook, tribal, tribal modern. And, and, and this is what's fascinating in the States. And if you remember the picture, if you saw it, the picture of this woman with the mask, you know, the, the cover uh, of the mask saying, you know, we were taking uh, 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 care of the sheep and and in the tents and then you have this uh, ultra modern uh, hyper uh, stainless uh, steel uh, mask uh, they really they live with that very easily <laughs> and the best way to see that is in the malls because in the city in these city states in the gulf the the shopping malls are a place where you can see that these function very well together. It is, for me, it's a show because I don't buy things when I go to the mall. I, I look at the people. <laughs> and um, Miriam Koch argues about these things. And she also expresses these, this fascination with how these states are molding identities, national identities, is that we can be both. We can be both modern and and uh, we can be traditional and they are very proud of it i think they are can be proud of it because they are aristocrats although i mean aristocrats when i say that i don't say it in the, the maybe european uh, old, old money kind of sense but they're aristocrats because they know they are rich i think this brings some kind of of uh, of uh, self-esteem because in these societies, all these layers, even the, the poorest citizen is better off than, the, than a more wealthy, I don't know, uh, Lebanese or Syrian or whatever. So it's, it's, it's this fascinating thing with, where citizenship rights, being members of these states, gives you the privilege and gives you the privilege to mold these identities in ways where where it is made possible. So uh, um, I think we can never understand these states if we don't understand the, the, the huge effect that you have states where you have welfare from, from cradle to grave. And so money talks a lot there. So I think it is money which sustains these societies and these layered understandings of na nationhood which mold the old and the new the traditional and the modern i know this is these are big words but these states are really trying to extend this understanding and they are they are getting away with it <laughs> they are really actually succeeding i cannot say anything but i i believe the book by Mary, Miriam Cook was really nice in in, lay, in putting these kind of uh, ideas in a nice way. I liked it at least very much. Well, I looked up the title, which I didn't know. So thank you for the recommendation. It looks like a fascinating read. So thank you, Rania. Um, let me 
take you to um, a comment that you made, which I think is, is very dear to uh, many of us, the Institute, which is the question of academic freedom, uh, which you mentioned. And um, I mean, I've had, you know, you know, some personal direct experience of that in the Gulf. I was wondering if you had, um, if you wanted to share with us um, how you perceived that to be limited or limiting um, while operating in the Gulf. Um, because I think that this would um, um, flesh out a bit the, 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 the question of uh, academic. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, like, uh, now I'm very privileged because I like Kuwait a lot and Kuwaitis are known, as I have understood later on, they are very open-minded. So my experience with the Gulf is very much tied to the Kuwaitis. I don't know why other uh, or Arabs in general seem to say that, oh, the Kuwaitis, they talk too much, but I like it because they are so open-minded, really. Most of the Kuwaitis I met from anyone on the streets to anyone in academia they are so outspoken this is so kuwait i think stands out really because when i went to other states or have talked with other gulf citizens because when you are in kuwait you meet saudis you meet emiratis in uh, you meet also in qatar you meet the whole world also other gulf citizens um they are much more not so wide speaking people they don't share their opinions opinions i think are more very much more elegant so when you call say about academic freedom i cannot go around and interview people in outside kuwait i have found out it's not easy so academic freedom in the sense that uh, you can not go around and just to give you an example i didn't want to go to al jazeera english when i was in qatar i went to uh, the national newspapers to interview people they didn't like to be interviewed with them. they were very very uh, respectable really nice took care of me said come tomorrow or you know the, the leader is not there and come tomorrow and so on after three times i understood they don't want to talk with me so i understood I understood that. So you don't have academic freedom to do, you know, the sort of fieldwork. I mean, I could do better fieldwork in Syria under censorship than you do in these states, which look very open, but are not at all, because people don't have the, at, until now, maybe don't have attributed this academic freedom discussion type of things. You, the young people, yes, they are nice, but I could go and study in classes. Maybe this is really interesting. This is what Miriam Cook did, actually, because the young are really open minded, they are eager, they want to share. But when you talk about people in position, no. So, so uh, this is my personal experience. The other thing I wanted to say is that even in conferences, when, when the academics come from uh, Gulf universities, uh, uh, they present their research openly but it is clearly they cannot write about the, the uh, problematic things like i would give one example we were in london at the gulf research council meeting in cambridge i think it was two years ago or whatever and we had this this panel with with uh, women uh, citizenship state building uh, in in the gulf and the thing which fascinated me most was that the UAE, you have a leader who is, you know, imprisoning his daughter. That was the big thing. I was interviewed in, in the newspapers or the radio in, uh, in, in Norway. And, and at that panel, there were like five people from the UAE. Nobody mentioned it for three days. And I thought that was very strange. You know, because that was hit the headlines in, in, in Norway, at least, or Europe and so on. And this Ben Zayed is treating his daughter so badly and nobody mentions it. And at, at last I had to raise my hand and say, I'm really fascinated. Why are you not talking about this subject which everybody is talking about in Norway? And then the, the people there said very frankly, you know, we cannot talk about these things. So. Uh, this is interesting, you know, you can talk about, uh, but you cannot talk about how you treat your own daughters in a state where uh, is what I think is, has been called by Le Monde, a little Sparta, <laughs> the UAE, you know, <laughs> they buy lots of weapons and launch wars of uh, peace in Yemen and so on. So, interesting. 
or tanks in Bahrain for that matter. Uh, or, or, or in Bahrain, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, I think that again, Um, you know, more chance than if you're actually working on the region. So someone like you doing field work yeah. there yeah. is quite a rarity. Um, so we're very, very blessed to have you. <laughs> yeah, and this is what I, this is why I say they want people to go back to their homeland. Mm -hmm. They don't want them to stay there, and they don't, you know, I'm, and I don't need to have my uh, income from there. So this is why maybe people are becoming less and less. And also in our university, when I say our universities, people are less like in Norway. They, they, they don't learn Arabic as they did 20 years ago. This is also an important thing. You have much Middle East studies without people learning, you know, Farsi, Arabic, Indian, Hindu, uh, you know, Urdu, uh, and all this, the, the languages. I find that problematic, that, that uh, you really don't invest in, in the places where you learn the languages is absolutely important if you want to do research to, to know the languages you know understand the language, write the languages mean the languages you cannot go there and you know do security studies and only know english and french or italian for that matter so yeah maybe you are right there is a rarity it's it's i'm i'm not sure about how much uh, people like me can be funded <laughs> in the long future <laughs> i hope they will we are we have, we are certainly very lucky to have you uh, to head you uh, you know after this very fresh experience. So let me uh, thank you and all the participants, but especially you, of course, uh, Rania. Let me also uh, thank um, Alexandra Khan for um, running the uh, webinar uh, from behind the scenes. Um, thank you to Raj for participating uh, as our co-hosts. And um, and so, um, as I wish everybody like a uh, happy Ramadan, um, please join me in virtually thanking uh, Rania for um, her lecture today. And we hope to have her soon, uh, some other time, either in London uh, or uh, somewhere else. Mm. Thank you very much, yeah. everybody. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good Ramadan. Bye.